Let us prepare to worship God. I will bless the Lord in all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt God's name together. Let us come to God in prayer. God of our calling, God of our finding, God of our neighbors, already this weekend you have convened your children from Minaret and Rural Mountain, from synagogue and urban sidewalks, from rescue missions and monasteries and temples, your children have gathered. Now us, O oh God, now us, find us here. As you find us, remind us that we did not sneak in through a narrow theological keyhole canopy that is this congregation. Now that you have found us and called us, hem us in, we pray. Empower those who shall lead and serve. Locate your word of truth in our preacher, Robert Michael Franklin thinker of theology, molder of men, evolver of ethics. By your very able spirit, locate your word of truth so richly invested in him. Move us to a greater place of wholeness, a greater place of compassion, a greater place of capacity. In the name of the one whose sheep are many and whose love is boundless, let the people say, Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is found on page four, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let us stand together.
Good morning. Please remain standing for the reading of the litany, which is found on page five. Dear Lord, thank you for drawing us as a congregation to you to become part of your church. Thank you for our ancestors. Help us to teach our young your ways and their history so they will know who you are and who they can be. Inspire us with a vision for the future and use that vision to direct the path of this congregation. Help us to learn not on our own understanding, but to lean on every promise of your word. Lord, please hide us in your bosom and protect us from all evil and from the wiles of those spirits that seek to destroy the peace you have given us. May your spirit continue to infuse our church with courage, hope, and grace. Teach us to know your voice and give us the courage to obey it. First Church. Good to the members of First Congregational Church, our esteemed guest speaker of the hour, friends and visitors, I greet you in the name of our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who makes us one. Amen. We welcome each of you as we celebrate our 152nd anniversary of First Church. On this day, we honor the tradition and rich history that makes up the DNA of our church. The first Congregational Church of Atlanta came into existence as a gathered church on May 26, 1867. Being one of the oldest African American churches in the United States, the early history of our church is ingrained in the history of the American Missionary Association. AMA, an ecumenical group of abolitionists, missionaries, and former students of Oberlin College in Ohio. One faction of the AMA you may be familiar with, led by New England churchmen in 1836, came to the aid of a group of African slaves aboard the slave ship Amistad. Their story was popularized in the 1977 movie directed by Steven Spielberg. Our church was, when our church was founded, it was a difficult time for, for our ancestors in Atlanta. Lynching, segregation, racism, Jim Crow flourished. Yet for a people whom life was so difficult, they made it their highest priority to begin a church. In 1877, the AMA donated land on the corner of Houston, now John Wesley Dobbs, and Cortland Streets for the erection of a little red church, which became a beacon of light for the African American community here in Atlanta, offering countless services for the community and philanthropic ministries. 152 years later, First Congregational Church still stands in downtown Atlanta as a church of mission, 
and ministry. Though surrounded by the ever-expanding Georgia State University, we too have also expanded our facility over the years to meet the needs of our congregation and its ministries. First Church, today we are singing praises to God on high, rejoicing with voices of gratitude and thanksgiving, waking the city of Atlanta and telling the people that First Congregational Church has been alive and active in the community of Atlanta since 1877. Let's give ourselves an applause. Yes, the road has not been easy, but we have survived. It has been a journey of courage and perseverance. Thanks to the leadership and ministries of Pastors Proctor, McEwen, Thomas, Rakes, Newman, and Andrews. So we pause to acknowledge and thank God for the abundant grace and mercy he has bestowed upon us. It has been said, and I concur, that a congregation is like a family. You know, in a family we have disputes, we argue, sometimes we don't get along. But I believe that God has designed our family and our church because to be that way, because he's looking for us to have patience, love, Amen. kindness, Amen. and forgiveness, Amen. and also to provide us with the necessary support systems to enhance the effectiveness of our church. In Hebrews 10, 24, the Bible tells us to consider how we may spur one another on towards love, good deeds, meeting with one another, and not giving up, as some are so often can do, but encouraging one another that love and good deeds has spurred us at First, at First Congregational Church. It has provided a positive sense of hope, family, and togetherness for our church members. In essence, First Church, we are struggling and, and striving to be that light in the village that offers hope to the poor, Amen. while at the same time meeting the broader needs of our congregation. Amen. A challenge insightfully explored in your book, Crisis in the Village, Restoring Hope in the African American Community, Dr. Franklin. Amen. Yes, we are old, 152 years old, but our thinking is not. We seek to remain relevant to life today and welcome all, no matter where you are in your life's journey. We come from many walks of life. We come to worship God and to serve him. First Congregational Church is a place where you can discover and develop your faith, a place where it's good to ask questions, a place to find answers as you grow in your faith. We seek to celebrate the best of the old and new traditions of our faith and worship. We are not afraid to try new things and embrace those things that allow us to worship God in spirit and in truth. In conclusion, as we celebrate this anniversary, we pray that our children of all ages and our friends from communities throughout Atlanta will know that First Congregational Church is a church that matters in our nation and in our community. We will, by God's grace, be an agent of change, an agent to do good work, how, when, where we can, growing forward, standing in testimony to a God that is still speaking. Thank you so much and enjoy your anniversary.
So all of you know that uh, Gerald Durley is my dear friend, and he is kind of the pastor's pastor. When I have problems with some of, some of you all, I go to Gerald. <laughs> and on more than one occasion, we've had a long afternoon of conversation. And so when Gerald says, I just want to have one moment, it's hard for me to deny him his one moment, Gerald. <laughs> Gerald, come on and, and tell us what you were going to tell us. No, no, but we need to hear you. Okay, uh, go ahead, but I want you to be heard. Hold on. Thank you. For the 30 minutes allotted me, uh, <laughs> I, wanted to, I didn't want to stand because I don't feel like a visitor. I feel like I'm the other's at home. But I feel a little awkward today because I'm not a Morehouse man, nor am I Omega. <laughs> I'm Tennessee State and Kappa. <laughs> but I, I want to just say to you that I had to be here. And the church, I just left preaching this morning at the 8 o'clock service. And I want to bring the thanksgiving from that congregation to you because they're thankful because I knew I was going to leave. I cut my sermon short <laughs> to be here because Robert Franklin is such a dear friend and Dwight. So I just bring you greetings and just glad to be here on your 152nd anniversary. God Amen. bless. Amen. Hey, thank you, Gerald. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Beloved, now is the time when we can all worship together and you can get a chance to express yourself. You can give a little testimony with the giving of your tithes and offerings. Whether you are a visitor or a stranger, there are no strangers in God's house. And we want to all lift up thanksgiving to God for all that God has done and is doing in our lives. I want to invite each one of you to think about and count your many blessings and to think about those blessings as you might testify by giving something back unto God, knowing that the work of this church is an expression of God's love in this community and in the world. Today we have two offerings. We have an offering that's taken for our general operations and the life of the church. And the second offering is taken for the missions, our mission work not only locally but around the world. And so I ask that you give, and I'm going to thank you in advance for your generosity. It's been a challenging year for us in terms of our stewardship, but I think if we continue to think about how good God has been to us, how how God has provided, literally, for each and everything that we have. I hope that you'll be able to express yourself today in a mighty way. I thank you in advance for your generosity. It will now be attended to by members of the Board of Trustees and also by members of the Mission Board. Our offertory piece today is going to be lifted up by the Third Sunday Band. And because we are such an ecumenical church, we wanted to do one of our ecumenical pieces. It's called A Baptist Beat. A Baptist beat. So we hope you enjoy it.
Bring the full tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, saith the Lord. And thus put me to the test, and see if I will not pour out for you an overflowing blessing. So much so your storehouse will not be able to contain it. Thank you, O oh God, as we celebrate 152 years here at First Congregational Church. We bring gifts to you, all of us, in forms of the collective blessings that you have given and entrusted to all of us. In faith, we praise and thank you for the next 152 years. For we know, based on our experience, that you just keep on blessing us over and over and over again. Amen. Amen. There's something that happens in worship. You work out the liturgy, you study the lectionary, you get all of the worship details together, but then something, something mysterious happens. Something mystical happens. The Spirit of the Lord descends. And almost in spite of all of our plans, God comes into this room in a powerful way. When we get to this moment of prayer, that's when I really feel the power and the mystery of worship. When we come together and pray as the people of God, as the family of faith, that's when something beyond all expectation happens. I want to invite each and every one of you to use this moment to lift up your deepest and ultimate concerns to God through prayer because God hears your prayers and God answers your prayers and God speaks to you and to me and to his creation. Morning by morning, new mercies. Let us pray. Lord, if these walls could talk, if they could cry out, if the spirits could speak to us now about the last 152 years, what would they tell us? Lord, what would their prayers be? What were their aspirations and their hopes? What were their dreams? What were their disappointments? What kept them keeping on? Only the grace of God and the power of prayer. Lord, in this 152nd year, hear our prayers. Because we are still dreaming we're still hoping. We're still hopeful, Lord. We're still troubled. We're still flawed and frail. But hear our prayers. That you might incline your ear to us. And then speak to our hearts. Lord, we're so grateful for this day all of the untold sacrifices that made this day possible, all of the people who, we don't know their names, but we know what they've done because we're here today, living in this, your house, and celebrating your legacy of light and love and mercy and mission. We may not know their names, Lord, but we know the path that they have cut for us. And Lord, 150 years from now, they won't know our names either. But let them know us by our witness, by our testimony, by our living and our loving, 
by our trust in your will. Lord, let them know us by our work. Lord, hear our prayers today because sometimes it's hard to work when you're troubled in your heart and in your soul and in your mind. Sometimes, Lord, it's hard to do the work when your body is afflicted. And so for all of us who are broken in one way or another, for all of us who are in need of healing of one type or another, Lord, be the divine physician that only you can be. Touch us, heal us, mend us. Do what we need, Lord, so that we can rise and keep doing what you've called us to do. For those, Lord, that have stopped believing in you and your power and the extent of your grace, Lord, remind us again of how far you brought us by faith. You promised never to leave us. You haven't left us yet. Why should we doubt or why should we fear? Because we already know you. Hear our prayers that our prayers might be an affirmation of what we already know but what we sometimes do not proclaim. Lord, be with our leaders throughout this entire world that they might know that there is a higher power. Let them know that there is only one truth, and that is your truth. Let them know, Lord, that there is no weakness in forgiveness and that in our weakness we are made strong and perfected by you. Lord, be with all of us today, but especially be with our preacher. We need to hear a word from you through him. Continue to bless him and his ministry. And continue to bless all of us that as we are changed by this worship service, we might know that you are a loving and awesome God. Lord, keep us ever mindful that we are not victims, but victors because Jesus got us the victory through his life and death and sacrifice and resurrection. Keep us ever mindful, Lord, of the prayer that he taught us in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 Our scripture lesson for this morning is from the New Testament, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. <clears throat> now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do you say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. 
And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The word of God for the people of God. Beloved, I have been entrusted with giving the introduction to our guest speaker today, and I will not be long because we have detailed many of his accomplishments in our worship bulletin. What I want to share with you is the fact that we sought Robert Franklin for such a time as this, for this anniversary celebration. There are great names in our society and in our history Names like Howard Thurman, Benny Mays, Dr. Martin Luther King. These are great leaders, great thinkers, great spirits. I believe that in the near future, names like Robert Franklin will be added to that list. And let me tell you why. There are great minds, but everybody does not put their mind to working, to building the kingdom of God. There are great theologians, but sometimes they find their work in a high, mighty building away from the people. Then there are servant leaders who bring all of that theology and all of that wisdom and all of that book learning down into the village to make the village a better place. There's nobody on this planet that's quite like Robert Franklin. Who can boast that he was college president, president of a seminary, great scholar, great theologian, great activist, worked in institutional settings, foundation settings, literally changing the shape and the way we think about philanthropy because of his theological and faith foundations. There aren't very many people that have done as much in such a short period of time as Robert Franklin that has literally changed the face of the way in which we think about our nation, ourselves, and our community. And so to hear Robert Franklin in this pulpit, to me, makes all the sense in the world. Because we do want to be a social justice church. We do want to be inclusive. We do want to understand why Jesus calls us to this. This is not an abstract idea. And Robert Franklin is the kind of mind that has brought all of that into his personal witness. We admire him. And I always ask, how can anybody do so much? I thought I was the most working man in show business, but I can't hold a candle to Robert Franklin. When I started to attend the Chautauqua Institution several years ago, and it's now become a part of the fabric of my life, it's because of Dr. Robert Franklin, who opened up Chautauqua to a wider array of voices and thinkers and motivators. And Robert, I owe you a great debt for that. But we go back many, many years to our beginning teaching careers at Emory. And so there weren't too many brothers then. There are not too many brothers now. But there, weren't, there were even fewer then. And Robert and I kind of met. Our minds met. And it's been a wonderful relationship ever since. After the next musical selection, my friends, you're going to hear from Reverend Dr. Robert M. Franklin. And let's thank him in advance for what he will do here. Jehovah, 
Thanks be to God for the ministry of First Congregational Church and to all who gather and worship this day. I am deeply humbled by this invitation. And as we pause on this morning to celebrate and to remember the blessings of institutional resilience, I reflect on the people who make it possible, who stand with and who people institutions to enable them to go forward in time and history. As I reflect on our years at ITC and Morehouse, I'm reminded of how many of the families and friends of this great congregation who stood with Cheryl and I, and so grateful to the Tatums and Hookers and to the Duffies and Dr. Durley and Professor Alfred and so many others, to the extraordinary clergy of this church who serve faithfully, and to this magnificent music ministry, none quite like it anywhere, anywhere that I know. Amen. Thanks be to God. You have heard a passage of scripture this morning, and you will pardon and permit me to observe protocol in not calling by name as I would love to and acknowledging so, so many friends whose faces I see this dear morning and how much we thank you for your friendship and we pray for you and we love you. Uh, and as you see, I am a freelance dissertation advisor and <laughs> So my, but thanks be to God for each and every one of you. This passage from Matthew 16, you've heard it many times during the course of your life and faith, your walk with Jesus, and I hope you will pay even closer attention to it after this morning as I call attention to something unusual that unfolds in this passage that is really quite unlike anything else we find in the New Testament, something unique, a hidden gem that we hope to uh, unlock. It is that moment when Jesus is speaking with his disciples in a private moment before the public drama that follows that would lead to his crucifixion, and he sits with them 
Matthew 16 and 15, and said, who do you say that I am? I know what others are saying about who, but whom, whom do you say? And Simon Peter answered in verse 16, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not prevail against it. May God bless the reading and hearing of this word. Indeed, as I reflect on 152 years of First Congregational Church history, and as I look at this congregation this morning, a congregation of Atlanta leaders, the leadership class of our great city, in the past and even now and well into the future, First Congregational has been and is now, always will be a congregation of leaders. In fact, looking at you this morning, I reflect and paraphrasing John F. Kennedy speaking to Nobel Prize winners, I have not seen such a collection of African American intelligence and beauty and grace seated in one place except when Michelle and Barack dined alone at the White House. <laughs> Another milestone in your history, 1867. And thank you, Sister Elizabeth Brown, for reading this history. It was more than reading. It was pronouncing. It was presenting. It was proclaiming the history of a great congregation. That very year when Howard University was established in Washington, D.C., when Morehouse College planted there in Augusta and later moved here to Atlanta meeting in Friendship Baptist Church, it prompts one to ask as we look at the history, 152 years, how did you do it? What was necessary to preserve and sustain over time through wars and reconstructions and failed reconstruction through depressions, through great conflicts and struggle. How did you do it? Dr. Tatum and I have reflected often on the elements of institutional viability and sustainability. In fact, in the mid-2000s, a number of studies were undertaken while there were so many companies coming into existence and disappearing, so many educational institutions that once were strong and vibrant, now they are no more. All kinds of organizations that had a proud history and are now defunct. How do you sustain over time? And one of the great studies that emerged in a book built to last by Jim Collins, and in a wonderful organizational report presented by Booz Hamilton and Allen, they asked the question, what makes for an enduring institution? And they assembled a group of global scholars from various sectors, and they all began to undertake their research, and they came back with answers. They all identified seven qualities I'll mention them in passing this morning, but part of it is to invite you to think about and celebrate how First Congregational manifest these qualities, but also think about other organizations you are a part of. And wonder if you think they all preserve or reflect these same qualities, and perhaps they have most of them, but not some of them, and that might prompt you to ask, perhaps we should pay attention to this. The first quality that they noted in the report, The World's Most Enduring Institutions, by Booz Allen Hamilton. The world's most enduring institutions was innovation. Innovation. The ability, as Booker T. Washington once said there in Tuskegee, to do common things in an uncommon manner. The ability to create, to invent, to try new ways of extending and manifesting your institutional mission, innovation. 
I don't know how many churches are blessed to have a jazz vespers, but First Congregational innovated. And this extraordinary pastor, this Renaissance man, dreamed, and you dreamed together, and now look at the magic. Innovation. Doing common things in an uncommon manner. The second quality they discovered was leadership and governance. That enduring institutions not only know how to innovate, to come up with new ideas to serve and reach people's spiritual and personal needs, but they also have effective leadership and governance. And how, much, how often we have seen un, institutions unravel for want of effective leadership. Or when they're good leaders, but the leaders and the governors and directors don't get along. Or for whatever reason, somehow there's a lack of alignment, leadership, and governance. In other words, the senior pastor, the CEO, she can't do it all by herself. <laughs> Leaders need effective support systems, and that's why it's so exciting to see these clergy on this front row, to see other leaders serving, to see you here standing with the lead. Innovation, leadership, and God. The third was that of information flow. When information flows throughout the institution, throughout the church, throughout the organization, rather than just three or four people on the inside, you have to stand in the parking lot to figure out what's really going on in this organization. You got to consult with the street committee. Oh, you know, y'all know about the street committee. Information flows throughout from top to bottom, from side to side. People are on the same page. And leaders don't use information like power. It's a, my secret. And you don't have it, so that makes me more powerful. They, no, rather, trusting leaders share information. They crowdsource. They open it up because they may get a good idea from some child standing in the crowd. Innovation, leadership, and governance, information for fourth culture and values. That the culture is such that the most important values that define this church, this institution, are evident. They permeate the culture, the very lifeblood. You walk in, you show up. As soon as you arrive, you know this institution stands for something special. The culture is just right. The fifth was adaptive response. They know how to adapt. That is the watchword at Harvard Business School these days. Adapt, adapt, adapt. Things are changing. Every eight to nine months, technology is breaking everything we had confidence in. Learn how to adapt. Be able to bend, to shift, to think it through. And that's what you have done, First Congregational. You figure it out. You adapt. We drove past this church during those months and years when you were renovated. Some people drove past and say, that church is dead, it's gone, it's boarded up. They didn't know inside you were working it out. Yeah. Adapting, adjusting, aligning for new circumstances that would enable your, your ecclesiastical mission. Adaptive response. That's when you sit down and think through, what if? What if this winter Atlanta experiences another snowmageddon? <laughs> what are you going to do if you're at work? And what do you do if you're at home and the power goes? What are you going to do if you're outdoors somewhere? Adaptive response. You think it through. And then risk management, number six. Everybody who is here this morning, you've got in a car, you've traveled somehow to be here, you probably addressed 20 or 30 different potential risks to be here, but you worked it out. You didn't allow that to prevent you from going forward. Risk management is to think through in advance. 
to serve your adaptive capacity, risk management. And effective organizations have a board, have committees, have people thinking through what if, what if, what if. You have done that over a century and a half. And then that final quality, innovation, leadership and governance, information flow, culture and values, adaptive response, risk management finally, that wonderful word, legitimacy. Legitimacy. In other words, your name carries a certain brand, a certain brand name equity. Your name, first congregational. It means something. Spellman, it means Coca-Cola. It means something. When people hear it, ah, they know that you are a legitimate leader in the field. Legitimacy. We ask people on the street, what do you think about the church here on the corner? They say, oh, that's a good church. They serve the community. They help. They've got great members who are friendly and kind, who reflect the love of Jesus. So all those qualities were identified by this global board of leaders. And then they were asked, give us one or two examples from your sector of institutions that embody all seven. It was fascinating. As they came up with this list, Reverend Milton, they decided that, well, in the world of business, that Sony Corporation was one, and GE. And then in the world of entertainment and sports, the modern Olympic Games, the world's most enduring institutions. In education, they identified Oxford University. And in the nonprofit sector, the Rockefeller Foundation. And there in the world of government, the US Constitution, the world's most enduring institutions. And in the world of arts and entertainment, they identified the rock group, the Rolling Stones. But Dr. Andrews, I quarrel with this list just a bit because it's something they left off. Somebody on the committee wasn't reading Matthew chapter 16. I build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Ah, that phrase ought to ring in your ears in joy. Will not prevail. You may face challenges and difficulties, but they will not prevail against the people of Jesus. And that unlocks this extraordinary insight in Matthew 16. If you go back and read it, and take a look a little time this afternoon when you go home, look at the passage in Matthew 16, because there is a play on words. There is a play on words. When Jesus looks at Peter, first of all, the situation of Jesus asking, who do men, who do people say I am? Isn't that interesting that Jesus would ask his disciples, in the midst of a busy ministry, who do people say that I am? This is the ancient version of Instagram or social media. You're trying to find, what are folks saying about me? Some think that you are a reincarnation of Elijah. Some think that perhaps you are Moses or Isaiah. And then he turns it on the class. He turns it on them and says, who do you say that I am? And there in that seminar, Brother Bailey, when he asks the question, who do you say? Here is the one student who never gets the answer right. You remember your high school, there was always that student in class. They, they, ne they didn't do any reading. They never got, it was always just wrong, just wrong-headed. You looked at them, what in the world are you talking about? And on that day, when he asked that critical question, who do you say that I am? Peter of all people. Cussing Peter. Hot-headed Peter. Never studying Peter. Spoke up, I know, I know, I know. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And he made Jesus back up. 
There's even a little slight shade in here. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. You didn't come up with this on your own. <laughs> a little shade. <laughs> I know you didn't study, brother. You didn't come up with Like the student caught cheating on a test, the teacher called him up and said, you, uh, you in trouble here. I know you cheated. You copied on Johnny's paper. He said, why, why, how do you know? No, why do you say that? How do you know he didn't copy from my paper? She said, because on question number four, Johnny wrote, I do not know the answer. And you wrote, me neither. But Peter receives the revelation about who this Lord really is. Jesus affirms it. And then he goes into this extraordinary little passage. Verse 18, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I build my church. What's going on there? Look at it carefully. I don't know about your Bible. When you go home, check your Bible and see if there's a note, a footnote, an asterisk. I've already checked your pew Bibles. The asterisk is there. And so I smiled. Because if you don't have an asterisk on this, you might want to upgrade your Bible. I, I don't mean any disrespect, but you are missing something when it's not highlighted. When he says, thou art Peter, Peter in Greek, in the masculine proper noun the name Peter is Petros P-E-T-R-O-S Petros but the word rock this solid foundation is Petra a feminine form of the noun and it means rock Petros Petra thou art Peter human flawed a man and upon this Petra, the rock, the foundation, I will build my church. There is a play on words there that is often missed in translation. It is as if Jesus is saying, you are human beings, but on this rock, on the spirit of God present in you, the spirit of the ancestor standing with you, Petra, that feminine, sacred feminine. I build my church. In other words, in order for the church to endure, to be resilient, there is a divine human partnership. You're Peter Petros, and upon this Petra, I built my church. And together, when human and divine are working in alignment, the gates of hell will not and cannot prevail against it. Oh, isn't that good news today? Isn't it good news that the church is a divine human partnership? Petros, Petra. And despite the troubles that we face, Jesus was trying to say to us that day, you were built to last. You were not built to fold or dissolve in the face of challenges. You're not built to melt under high temperatures and pressure. And indeed, First Congregational, you have been there through the difficult times, standing with us and giving us hope, providing us with faith, hope, and love. You endured and you saw us at our best. You saw us at our worst. You were there and you prayed in 1895. When Booker T. Washington stood over in Piedmont Park and told us, cast down your buckets where you are. Do not leave your land in the South. And yet the pressures and the terror of domestic terrorism were too high. But also in 1895, the National Medical Association and the National Baptist Convention, the largest black doctors and black preachers organizations in the world came together. They ramped up from retail ministry to wholesale ministry. And that was in 1895, and First Congregational, you were there praying for us. 
You smiled in 1900 when James Weldon Johnson pinned the words to lift every voice and sing. 1900. For five years, it was just a poem. Then his brother sat down. And Brother Dwight, John Rosamond wrote the music and put the poetry to the music. And now NAACP said, now we have a Negro national anthem. First Congregational, you nodded in 1903 when W.B. Du Bois, who loved to worship here and loved a lot of the women here, he, when he published the souls of black folk. First Congregational, you stood vigilant when Atlanta almost lost its mind in 1906 when the great race riot and burning of black communities and shops and stores. You applauded in 1909 when the NAACP was established and brought forward militant and intelligent leadership. You shouted when Ida B. Wells published her Southern Horrors, documenting lynching between 1880 and 1920. You wept in 1913 when Harriet Tubman laid her sweet head down on the pillow for the last time after rescuing over 70 enslaved Africans from bondage to freedom. Yes, and you approved in 1920 when the Harlem Renaissance flourished. Look up there and see Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston, Alain Locke and County Cullen, Duke Ellington and Ethel Waters, Louis Armstrong picked up his horn. You were there, First Congregational, nodding in approval. You were applauding when Alonzo Herndon became Atlanta's first black millionaire. You voted when Gracetown Hamilton became the first black woman to serve in the Georgia General Assembly. Yes, you were there noticing when young Martin Luther King used to walk down the streets of Auburn as a teenage boy. Yes, and you dined when the Pasco brothers first served fish and grits on the menu. Yes, you shouted when Maynard Jackson was first elected our first black mayor. And then you really had a fit when Andrew Young not only elected congressman and U.S. ambassador, then he became the mayor. Good God Almighty, you have been there. You've seen us at our best and you've seen us at our worst. You howled when Hank Aaron hit and broke Babe Ruth's record. You rejoiced when Senator Leroy Johnson invited Muhammad Ali back to Atlanta to box. You laughed when the Olympic Games came to our city, made us grown up city. And you cried when the Atlanta Falcons lost the Super Bowl. But then you took notice when a little 10-year-old boy first picked up a saxophone by the name of Dwight Andrews. That's the story of a church that endures for 150 plus years. And you did it because of Matthew 16. The gates of hell will not prevail because thou art Peter and upon this rock I build my church. The gates will not prevail. Hemingway wrote, life breaks all of us, but some of us are made strong in the broken places. You were built to last despite your brokenness, despite the pain, despite death and disappointment, despite divorce and depression, you were built to last. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. It was grace that brought us safe this far, and grace will lead us home. You've seen us at our best. Stand with us, First Congregational. Up, you mighty people. You can accomplish what you will.
Beloved, we're going to open the doors of the church. And I can't imagine a better sermon upon which to open the doors of the church than what you just heard here. Dr. Franklin, that was a marvelous message that will preach here and there at any time and any place. And if you don't have a church home and you want to know why you need a church home, that sermon tells you that you might find a place where you can thrive, not just survive, but thrive. If I didn't have a church, I would join the church today because of that message I just heard. I think you get some sense of why we, we value Robert Franklin because he connects for us so many important dots about who we are and how we think about who we are. If today is your day to join a church in fellowship, we want you to consider First Congregational Church. We've had a good 152 years, but beloved, it's gonna get even better. The best is yet to come. Oh my God, amen, amen. Oh Lord, amen. I'm gonna come down here and we're gonna welcome Sister Tanya to our fellowship. What a wonderful day for you to join us. Beloved, I'm gonna ask you all to stand. Let's sing that refrain as we get ourselves together to welcome Tanya. Amen, amen. I thought that my joy couldn't be any higher until I saw Tanya come down and say that she wanted to join us in fellowship. Beloved, before we get a chance to let her change her mind, I want you to turn to page 34 in the front of your hymnal that we can take Tanya into full membership of this church. She's been worshiping with us for some time. She's been singing in our choir. She's been singing with the Atlanta Jazz Chorus. And this is one of those leaders of Atlanta who has helped to shape this very culture that we lift up today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I know you don't have your glasses on, but you don't, you don't have to say much. I'll do all the work. Um, <laughs> beloved, turn to page 30, 34. Hear the words of our Lord. You did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Everyone who acknowledges me before men and women, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Tanya, Jesus Christ has chosen you and in baptism has joined you to himself. He has called you together with us into the church, which is his body. Now he has brought you to this time and place to unite with us in the ministries and blessings of this congregation. As you come into our midst, we invite you to reaffirm your faith as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. Do you reaffirm your faith in God as your Father, 
in Christ as your Lord and in the Holy Spirit as your strength? And do you promise to participate in the life and mission of this family of God's people, sharing regularly in the worship of God and enlisting in the work of this congregation as it serves the community and the world? Let us, the members of First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, express our welcome and affirm our mutual ministry. We welcome you with joy as partners in the common life of this church. Amen. Tanya, let me be the first one to extend the right hand of fellowship and the old-fashioned Christian hug. I want to ask everyone to just touch somebody nearby that we might pray in this moment. Gerald, come on and pray for her as she joins this fellowship. Uh, you will be prayed on today. This is this Tanya Coleman. The angels in heaven rejoice. The members of First Church rejoice. And this is your moment. The Bible talks about Kronos moments and Kairos moments. This is a Kairos moment divinely inspired by God Almighty. Eternal and Almighty, righteous God, we thank you for this very special Kairos moment. A moment ordained by you, God, that you bring this powerful sister into the fellowship of this congregation. We ask that you would continue to anoint her, bless her, lift her up. Never let her bow, bend, nor break when the winds of adversity come and attack her life. God, just surround her with goodness and grace and let her continue to be the kind of person that she's exemplified all these years singing with the group. But God, it's one thing to be on the battlefield, but now she's in the battle. God, let us understand that while we continue to lift her up, that this congregation will surround her with support, with love, and whatever she needs. God, thank you for this blessing today. Thank you for being a blessing. We ask now, God, that you would surround not only her physical body, but touch the spirit deep down inside of her. You said, don't worry about this physical dirt tent, but always be concerned about that spirit. So, God, she's united with a powerful spirit-filled pastor and all of those in this congregation. Let her feel the joy of her salvation. God, let her feel the peace that surpasses us all understand and allow that peace that you can only give control how she thinks and how she feels. Right now she's feeling well and she's thinking well because she's at peace, because she's at home, not only in heaven, but at First Congregation. We ask it all in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all those that got excited about this new member here. That we hear them saying amen. amen. They can't hear you across the street. Amen. They can't hear you around the corner. Amen. Let them hear them in Atlanta. Amen. Welcome. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Beloved, please remain standing for our benediction and our choral benediction. When the service is over, Dr. Franklin will go downstairs to receive you in the receiving line, and we do have a wonderful reception plan. So please meet us downstairs. This has been a blessed, blessed day. It's not over yet, so we want to fellowship for a while and celebrate. I want to thank my brother Robert Franklin for giving us a powerful message that will Walk with us for a long way. Robert, would you give us the benediction and our acolyte will come forward and take the light back out into the world. On this day where there is so much brokenness in the world, we are comforted by the light of Jesus Christ that animates us and keeps us strong. And we pray for all those whose hearts are heavy this day. We pray for those who face uncertainty in the future. Gracious God, help us to hear the words of the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, 
who prayed the simple prayer that may carry us each day if we reflect on its words. God, grant us, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Go with us this day in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah.